disconnected there and you can see this bubbles it would if it didn't leak <laughs> anyway I think you get the idea that it can go through there through the water to be humidified now the reason that we want to humidify it is that when you humidify it you add water to it you get that bit, that lots of little water dropules and water vapour in the oxygen because the oxygen supplied in cylinders and uh, pipe supplies in hospitals is, is quite dry and if that's given for any period of time the dry air will tend to dry out the patient's airway which you want to avoid because if the airway dries out it means the secretions produced by the chest will no longer be mobile and the cilli won't be able to waft them up to be coughed up so you'll get dry encrusted uh, sort of mucus and that's going to become infected and cause all sorts of lung problems. So patients that are on oxygen for any length of time, the oxygen should be humidified. So oxygen should be humidified, given for longer time periods. And a written record of the times and the levels of oxygen administration should be kept so we know how much oxygen the patient has had for how long. And some patients require long-term oxygen therapy for chronic conditions at home. If this is available, of course. Now, of course, when we're carrying out any nursing procedure, as well as our nursing skills, we need to be familiar with the equipment. So let's think about the sort of equipment we're going to be using in administration of oxygen. Well, first of all, the oxygen supply. Always got to make sure we use the correct uh, cylinder or the correct wall supply. A bit difficult to get this wrong, but it could happen that a patient was actually given the wrong gas because we have different gases you use in hospitals and we must, of course, use the right one. So oxygen cylinders, in the UK anyway, um, at least all the ones I've come across, are black with a, a white band around the top. Uh, to indicate the oxygen. Uh, air is carried in usually greyish cylinders which have a black and white uh, banding on the top. And just to give another example, uh, blue cylinders uh, with a blue and white top are entonox. But of course if you're in a different area or different country that, that may be different. So what you've got to find out is how it is coded in your area. You get different sorts of flow meters. Normally they'll have a tap on the bottom for turning it on and off, something like that. And normally they have some sort of uh, chamber with the, the, the uh, flow rate in liters a minute normally. Something like this. Something like that. And the, 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 there's a chamber up the middle. And what normally happens is there's a, there's a float in here in the chamber. Another colour so you can see it. So when the float is there, it's very obvious that you're giving uh, six litres uh, per minute. But th these will, of course, vary depending on where you are. And then there'll be an output port there for the oxygen to, to connect up your tubing. And you connect your tubing to this part, to the patient there. And uh, the supply normally comes in from the back, actually. So you adjust the, adjust the, the knob till you get the the float at the level you want and on all the all the flow meters I've seen they've, they've always been in liters per minute so normally quite a straightforward matter using the flow meters to set the flow of oxygen in terms of liters per minute now the tubing very often here uh, we use this uh, green um, variable length type uh, tubing. Um, it's got thicker bits and uh, thinner bits. This is typical type oxygen tubing. We call it bubble tubing actually. And uh, the reason it's got thicker bits and thinner bits is you can chop it at a thick bit if you've got to put it on something thick and a thin bit if you want to put it on something thin because of course you always want to ensure there's a good seal um, round about the tubing and the, the mask or the source, otherwise the oxygen will just be leaking. Different tubing available, this is a slightly, uh, slightly wider one. 
And when you're giving humidifying therapy, it does need to be wider. So green bubble tubing, fine for short term therapy, but use wider tubing for longer term therapy when humidification is required. Because if you use narrow tubing with humidification, the water tends to, um, what's the term, condense, condense out uh, into the tubing rather than be carried on to the patient. So thinking about masks here, we see a fairly typical type of uh, disposable mask within a piece of elastic goes around the patient's head and um, can fit on over the mouth and nose and they can breathe. Breathe through that, but I can't talk through it, so I'll take it off. And these often have uh, another tubing here connected up to them. And you'll notice here there's another part that determines the concentration of the oxygen. So obviously you need to use the right tubing with the, the appropriate mask to make sure the concentrations are accurate. And then the actual delivery tubing just fits onto the bottom of that. And this goes off to the oxygen supply. So different sorts of masks. So thinking about the masks, or sometimes you just use nasal cannula that just fit into the, uh, the nostrils as another way to deliver the oxygen. So some venti masks allow to uh, air, air to mix with the oxygen to control the percentage accurately, as we've already discussed. Now, normally, if you're giving oxygen for a short term, it's not so important to control the concentration, but for longer term therapy, it becomes important. And it's particularly important in chronic obstructive airways disease that the concentration is known. And uh, it, doesn't, it shouldn't exceed 24% in chronic chest conditions. So different masks, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about all the different masks, what you need to do is find out what is available locally to you, work out what concentrations it supplies, work out how to use humidification, and generally familiarise yourself with the equipment that you're going to be using on a day-to-day -day basis. But these are the principles. So nasal cannulas, for example, will allow more freedom uh, of movement, but give lower concentrations. So I've got an example of a, of a nasal cannula here. There's a single uh, tube supply from the source. And uh, these just uh, comes into a double source there at this junction box. And these uh, just fit around the patient's head. And uh, the, the, the cannulas just go into the nose here. So as the patient breathes, oxygen is being delivered directly into the nose and leaves the mouth free and the patients can walk around and things to, to an extent. So different ways of delivering it. Nasal cannulas there, for example. And tents and incubators, oxygen tents may be used for younger children who wouldn't tolerate using um, a, a mask or a cannula. So in, in this circumstance, normally you'd put the, uh, put the child maybe the, if, if they're on a bed, say, you'd put the tent all over the bed like this and fill the whole atmosphere with the enhanced amount of oxygen. Young children and uh, in, uh, infants. <clears throat> this is the way that neonates are nursed, for example, in, in, in incubators. Right, humidifiers. We've mentioned that very often the oxygen needs to be humidified. And very often, um, as we saw before, well, the one we saw before actually had water in. And uh, the oxygen supply would actually bubble through the water, and then be taken off there and go to the patient. That will be the top of the container. You'd have to have a top on, obviously. So the oxygen will be coming in here, picking up the water from here as it passes through the water, and then leaving here to go to the patient in a humidified form. Although very often, um, they're not like this, they're, well, they're similar, but the, uh, the oxygen, you have water in there again. 
and the oxygen actually just blows onto the surface of the water there like that.